this case, most of the principals were out on bail. It put me out on a limb. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar, starring Charles Russell. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is just an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by special investigator Johnny Dollar to Max Krause, Krause Bail Bond and Insurance Agency, New York City, New York. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my investigation of two of your clients, or witness, witness, who's got the witness? Or, he said, give me liberty or give me death, and got both. Expense account, item one. One dollar, one cigar, to replace the asphyxiating stogie you were smoking when you arrived unannounced at my Hartford apartment door. My name is Max Krause. Here's my car. Krause Bail Bond Insurance Agency, State, Federal, and Immigration. All forms of surety bonds and insurance. Got it? <coughs> yeah, I got it. Oh, well, I got a job for you to the tune of saving me $50,000. <coughs> okay, okay, you can come in. Huh. But you'll have to tie up that cigar outside. Okay. Here, better yet, give it to me. Hey, hey. Thanks. Come on in. Hey, what's the idea of throwing it out in the window? That was an expensive cigar. Oh, can you think of a better way to get rid of it? It was killing me. Here, have one of these. Hmm? Oh. Ah. Well, not the quality I'm used to, you understand, but much obliged. Forget it. They were a gift. Maybe I won't even charge you for it. If I go to work for you. Well, shall we find out if I will or not? Oh. Sit down. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you know about Leo Persin? <laughs> Just what I read in the paper. Did you put up his bail? I wish I had. Well, the bonds I put up were for two prosecution witnesses. Know what I mean? Yeah. And they either took a run out, jumped from one of the bridges, or some of Leo's men put them out of the way. You get me? Uh, vaguely. They're gone. Yeah, that's right. And unless I can prove they're dead or find them, you understand, before the trial, which is a week from today, I forfeit the 50000 25 apiece. See my problem? Yeah. Huh. Tell me something, Mr. Krause. Why don't you come to me? Well, I'll tell you why. To the police... These witnesses are only two names on a long list of missing persons. You up with me? Uh-huh, yeah. Now, and as for private detectives, I could never be sure that one wouldn't make a deal with Persino and make more money not finding them than I'd be paying to find them. Get the point? Yeah. Well, uh, what makes you think you can trust me? Oh, well, you were mentioned by one of the insurance companies I sell for. They tell me that you're straight, except for padding your expenses here and there. Hmm? Hey, now, that's an insult. Ah, what's a little padding? <laughs> I used to do the same with my old man when I was in grade school. That's kid stuff. You'll find out. What's that? I said uh, I'll find out what I can. Who are these lost, strayed, or stolen witnesses? <clears throat> Nippy Cochran is one. Real name is Glenn, you hear? Glenn. Yeah. The other is Dan Patterson. I got their addresses next to Ken, you know what I mean? What else do you need? A big, fat retainer, about 2,500 bucks. Ah, that's pretty steep. I've only got a grand with me. It just so happens that I'm a grand person to do business with, Mr. Krauss. I'll take the thousand. Expense account, item two, 345, train fare, Hartford to New York. A high wind and I hit the big city at the same time, 4 p.m. to be exact. So I set storm canvas and tanked cross town toward 81st between Madison and 5th. One of the bits of information that had come with that $1,000 bit of paper was the fact that one of the missing witnesses, Nippy Cochran, had a sister. Stage name, Mona Doyle. She'd been born in Hell's Kitchen and she'd worked out her own little recipe consisting of brains, beauty, and cheesecake to cook up her own version of heaven on earth including Angel's Broadway type. When I hove to in front of her 81st Street brownstone, a delivery boy was buzzing his way into the building. 
Not wishing to argue with Mona over the intercom system on the buzzer panel, I waited for the boy to come out. Caught the door before it closed. Thanks, bub. Went in and up to a second floor apartment. My name is Dollar. You don't know me, but uh, I have some news about your brother. Oh? Just a second, I'll let you in. Come in. Thanks. What's this news you have about Nippy? Oh, well, the uh, guy who put up bail for him, Max Krause, has hired an insurance investigator to look for him. Oh? Well, what am I supposed to do about that? Ask me to sit down. I'm the investigator. Well, you're awfully clever, aren't you? No, I hire a couple of radio writers to work these things out for me. Well, please do sit down. Thank you. Uh, why did you do it this way? Didn't you think I'd let you in if I knew what you were? Well, lots of people are allergic to what I am. Well, I'm not. That helps. Do you know where your brother is, Miss Doyle? No. Now, um, could I fix you a drink? Does that mean that this is the end of our little discussion? Mr. Dollar, I don't know where Nippy is, believe that or not. I haven't seen much of him the last few years. He doesn't approve of me, and I don't approve of him. But that doesn't make any difference. What does is that if I did know where you could find him, I wouldn't tell you. I don't hate him enough to kill him that way. That way? Are you holding out for a choice? Hey! That was a nasty thing to say. Well, that slap you handed me ought to make us even. Don't you know what would happen if you found Nippy and brought him back? Oh, I've heard that Leo Porcina has some quaint habits with people he doesn't want around. Something about wrapping their feet in a concrete block and lowering them into any handy river. Uh, but the law gave him protection until after the trial. What difference would that make? Even if Leo were convicted, don't you think he'd leave orders behind to take care of Nippy? Well, that could probably be worked out, too. Well, look, I wasn't hired to worry about that. I was hired to find your brother so my client won't lose his money. Well... Oh, this is a lousy way for two people to meet, isn't it? I wish it were different. What's that supposed to mean? Well, I'd... I'd like to ask you again to have a drink with me. That wind has my nerves jumping. And you haven't helped. Be a good guy, won't you? With what she had to back up that invitation, I defy any guy, good or bad, to come up with anything but an acceptance. Unless he was crowded in 70 and had a car double parked outside, and was married to a suspicious wife who was waiting in the car. So, I stayed, and we learned to know one another. Twenty minutes later, we were close friends. I knew it had to end, and it did. The door buzzer sounded, and Mona bounded over to the little button that controlled the lock on the downstairs entrance. Don't be shocked, Johnny. I brush off a lot of my admirers this way. The only thing I admire about you is the act you put on. It's a good one. I'm glad you enjoyed yourself. There was one thing I forgot to tell you about my brother. I can hardly wait. I'm all ears. He gave me everything I have. Without him, I'd have none of all this. What, is it Nippy who's on his way up here? That isn't what I mean. All Nippy did was introduce me to Leo Porcina. That's who's on his way up. Oh, yeah. Well, blood may be thicker than water, but where you're concerned, it isn't thicker than champagne with ermine on the side. Come on in and see what's on you. Well, what do you know about this? Who's he? Johnny Dollar, an insurance investigator, hired by Krauss to find Nippy. Well, it's interesting. Yes, it is. Oh, boy. What are you going to say for yourself? Matter Harry there said everything there is to say. Except that I'm also looking for the other missing witness, Dan Patterson. Yeah, yeah, I assume that. Very apt, Mr. Dollar, that we should meet this way. Two men interested in the same uh, subject. The subject was more interesting before you came in. I'll ignore that. Natural, what I meant was that I, too, am quite anxious to find Nippy and Patterson. Oh, can I mix you a drink, Leo? No, no, leave us alone, Mona. Go in the bedroom. All right, Leo. And close the door, please. Now, uh, man to man, Dollar, how do you propose to go about finding Nippy and Patterson? <laughs> what would you suggest, Porcina? Dragging the rivers? 
Now, see here, Dollar, there's no need to take such a a pessimistic view. I realized that an unfriendly press has endowed me with a reputation for violence, but I I don't deserve it. I hope you aren't bucking to be canonized. (laughs) That's a picture, isn't it? St. Leo Porcina. (laughs) Saint. Quite a sense of humor, Dollar. But my motives are honorable. I'm not afraid of the testimony of those two men. I want them back because their disappearance makes it look bad for me. It's the kind of thing that uh, sways public opinion. (laughs) I got nothing against them. I'll believe that when I see the three of you enjoying a nice, friendly game of billiards. Well, have it your own way. I thought we could form a combination, you and me, to find the boys. But a combination's no good if I trust you and you don't trust me. (laughs) Go ahead, Dollar. Bullet through alone. And good luck to you. Thanks, Leo. I've enjoyed your pack of lies no end. So I put on my top coat, picked up my hat, and left. He didn't shoot me while I was on the stairs, so by the time I felt the sidewalk underfoot, I also felt fairly safe. But not for long. The chauffeur in a limousine parked at the curb took off his uniform cap and put on a hat with an eye-hiding brim. I looked up at the lighted window of Mona Doyle's apartment and saw Leo's figure just slipping out of sight. As I started down the street, the chauffeur was no longer a chauffeur. At a signal from Leo, he had turned into a man who was following me. I grabbed a cab on Madison... And by the time our zigzag trip to Patterson's address was over, I felt reasonably sure that I was no longer being followed. The hall was like a mine shaft and smelled worse. Four doors down on the right, I found the number of Patterson's apartment. Come on in. The man who bid me enter was still wearing the hat with the eye-hiding brim. But something new had been added to his right hand, 45 caliber. Leo Porcina's chauffeur hadn't followed me to Patterson's address. He beat me there. Close the door. I don't like to ask foolish questions, but what are you doing here? I live here. Or I did. Oh, Patterson. Oh, great. I'm looking for you, and the way I do it is to try and get away from you. Look, take the little of your right hand, will you? I want to talk to you. Sure, but not here. Let's go someplace. <laughs> For me, that someplace was out. But before I got there, I had time to pass myself a question. What better place for a missing witness to hide than the employ of the guy he was supposed to testify against? Then I found a hiding place of my own. It was nice and dark, but the only person I was hiding from was me, Johnny Dollar. America's fabulous insurance investigator. Fabulous indeed. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, a battle to the finish, a no-holds-barred as far as words and opinions are concerned. That's only one of the entertaining elements of People's Platform, a Sunday daytime feature on most of these same CBS stations. Attack and defense and attack again. Politicians, labor leaders, statesmen, farm leaders, men and women from all walks of life find themselves going from the frying pan into the fire many times in each Sunday half-hour session. You'll enjoy People's Platform every Sunday on CBS. Now, with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. When my brain started the trip back from unconsciousness, I thought at first I'd passed out in one of the tunnels. The air, what there was of it, was thick with the smell of burned gasoline. It was still dark, and it seemed like cars were going past me without headlights. Then I noticed that the tunnel was moving. It took me a long time to figure out that meant it wasn't a tunnel. It was a car, and I was on the floor in the back seat with a blanket covering me. It took two hands and all my strength, but I managed to lift the blanket away from my face. (laughs) 
The first thing I saw was one of those old-fashioned speaking tubes that sometimes are used between a limousine's rear and driver's seat. It was hanging down, the mouthpiece a few inches from my head. But what was coming out of it was not noise, but that smell of burned gasoline, carbon monoxide. I didn't have to try them to know that all the doors were locked from the outside and that all the glass was unbreakable. From there, it took me only one short mental step to realize that speaking tube was connected to the exhaust pipe, and I was in the process of being executed in laughing Leo Porcina's private gas chamber. There's nothing so exhilarating as being slapped in the face with death. I wrestled a handkerchief out of my breast pocket, twisted it up into a stopper, jammed it into the tube, and clamped my hand over the mouthpiece. It didn't help the air any, but at least it wasn't getting any worse. Then I settled back to wait, trying not to breathe. Chauffeur, leg man, executioner, Dan Patterson. Opened the rear door. When we came to a stop, waited a few seconds for the wind to clear out the fumes, then reached in, grabbed me under the shoulders, and dragged me out. I managed to stay limp until we got a few yards off the road and into, into the brush. Then I dug my heels in and he... It was surprise more than strength that toppled him, but it was no time for niceties. I picked up a handy rock and bashed him one on the head. Danny boy, uh, get with it. You'll catch your death of coal lying on this uh, damp ground. Wh- wh- oh, dollar. Yeah, dollar, which uh, probably makes you feel like two cents. Listen, I couldn't help what I did. But Leo is either do what he tells you to or get it done to you. Oh, say that uh, pitch for the jury, will you? I want some answers. Uh, First, where are we? In New Jersey, about 40 minutes south from the city. Listen, give me a break. I'll, I'll help you all I can. I ought to break your head. Uh, and save your time and effort. There's nothing in that shoulder holster your hand is moving for. I've got it. Now, do I use it or do you tell me where Nippy Cochran is? I don't know. I swear I don't. You've got to believe that. If I knew, I'd sell the information to Leo for plenty. He wants him bad. Yeah, dream boy. I'll just bet you would. Okay, get up. Uh, wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait, what are you going to do? I was hired to find you and I found you. And now I'm going to put you away where you'll keep. Come on, get up. Listen, maybe I do know where Nippy is. Why don't you and me? Patterson, I'll have to stop you. I didn't want to fire, but I had to, and fast in the darkness. Aim was next to impossible, but I shot low. I guess it takes more lead than I threw into him to kill a guy who's so full of mental poison. Patterson was alive when I got to him, and alive and conscious when I left him in the hands of the nearest police doctor. Score? One up. One witness found and one still missing. Expense account, item four, 50 cents. Toll paid to get Leo Porcina's lethal limousine across the George Washington Bridge and back into New York City. Expense account, item five, five cents. Phone call soon after I got there. Yes? This is Dollar. Let me speak to Leo. Oh, Johnny. Yeah, sorry to disappoint you, but I'm alive and almost well. Johnny, I don't know what you mean, and I don't care what you think of me. You gotta help me. With what? Nailing my casket together? Nippy's in town. He, he killed Leo. Oh? Well, if it's true, that's a switch. All over the country, defendants are knocking off witnesses, but when I show up, the witness knocks off the defendant. I repeat, if true. It is true. I was with Leo. We, we went from here to his apartment. Nippy came in with a knife and. You gotta help me. I don't know what to do. Well, it's generally a good idea to call the police. Did you? Are you crazy? Probably. Where is Leo's apartment? Do you have to go over there? Well, why not? All right. Pick me up here. I'll take you over. Goodbye. Hmm. Whether she was asking me or telling me, she was right. I must be crazy. I gave myself ten to one odds that my journey would end in a trap. But I've been wrong before. Leo Porcina was in his apartment all right ungracefully spread out on the floor in front of a not-quite-clean white leather chair. There he is. What are you going to do? Knife wound, left side of chest. No signs of struggle. 
Where were you? I was in the other room. You didn't see it happen? No, I, I hardly heard anything. I, I didn't even hear Nippy come in. The, the radio was on. I, I heard a mumble of voices that didn't mean anything. And then Leo screamed, Nippy. And I ran in there, and Leo was just falling, and Nippy was watching him go down. I, I wish I knew whether you were bawling because you're grief-stricken or because you're scared. I wish I knew a lot of things about you. Now, come on. Let's go back to your place. And maybe I can find out. Here you are. Johnny Walker for Johnny Dollar. Oh, thanks. Would you also say it's Johnny on the spot? I don't know why I thought I had the right to ask you to help me. Well, I didn't have anyone else to turn into. Oh, you ought to improve your dialogue. I'm not trying to be clever, Johnny. I'm petrified. Nippy knows I saw him. I, I'm the only one that saw him. If, if you could just stay with me until I could get out of town or until this... Until this is cleared up. If I could keep my eyes closed, I'd say you weren't worth it. What you're trying to tell me is that you're afraid Nippy will show up with his dandy little carving set and go to work on you. Is that it? It's an awful thing to say about my own brother, but that's right. I'm afraid he'll kill me. He hates me. He blamed me when Leo kicked him out of the combination. Was he right? Of course not. But I couldn't make him believe me. He swore he'd pay us off. He did. He sold the information that got Leo indicted. and Now he's killed him. You know, that's an interesting point. That he'd go to all the trouble to turn state's witness against Leo and then kill him. Why would he do that? To... I don't know. What you started to say was to make it look as though you killed him, wasn't it? Yes. He'd do anything to hurt me. Johnny, if you, if you only knew... Hold it, hold it. Never mind the dust in my eyes, gorgeous. To frame you, Nippy would have to supply you with a motive. Unless you already had one kicking around someplace. And your silence says you probably have. Johnny... Leo was nailed on tax evasion because it turned out that he had undeclared income deposited in various banks under various people's names. How much is in your account? This much. Not very. Doesn't take a wizard to add two and two and come up with a motive. With Leo out of the way, there's very little chance that you'll be dragged into court as an accomplice. And I'll mention in passing the bank balance you didn't deny having. I, I know it looks bad, Johnny. Please put your drink down. Well, why not? It's empty. I know it looks bad. I, I'd be in big trouble if the police found out about the account. But do they have to, Johnny? According to all the rules, yeah. I didn't kill him, Johnny. You've got to believe that. I'd like to. You've got to, darling. Don't you think it'd be worth it? There's the money. And there's me. Darling. Oh, Johnny. Get away from me! Well, Johnny, what's wrong? In this case, everything. I've been slugged and gassed. I'd have shoot a man. I missed my dinner. But the worst of all is you. You think because you've got your kind of hair and your kind of eyes and mouth and the rest of it, you're going to hide all your lies and greedy ideas behind them and put a leash on any man you see. Well, it might work with a human being, but I'm not human. I'm an insurance investigator. What are you going to do? I'm going to turn you in for murder. That's what I'm going to do. Operator, operator, get on this thing before I change my mind. Mona didn't really turn on the tears until two men from Homicide took her and tucked her into a squad car. And I didn't warm up to my story until the press arrived. In print, in a very early morning edition that hit the stands at 12.01 a.m., it looked even better than it had sounded. Headline, Insurance Investigator Records Confession of Murderess. Lead. Police, late last night, booked Mona Doyle for the murder of Leo Porcina, racket boss. In an exclusive statement, Johnny Dollar, Hartford, said he was able to record the voluntary confession of the shapely knife killer by means of a tape recorder and a microphone concealed beneath a sofa, thus lifting the suspicion from her brother, Glenn Nippy Cochran, who has been sought for the slaying. The wind was dying, and so was I by the time I got back to my hotel after making one stop at an all-night drugstore for expense account item seven, uh, $1.79, adhesive tape, which might be classified as an odd item, since I didn't, as yet, have any broken bones. 
In my hotel room, I put the tape and the two telephone books, one classified, one general, to what I hoped would be good use, slipped on a dressing gown, and sat down to wait. An hour and ten minutes later, it turned out that I'd waited long enough. Uh, yeah? Who is it? A telegram. Well, you can't say much for his originality. Wait a second. I'll slip on a robe. Okay, Dollar, get back in the room. This is hardly the way to deliver a telegram, is it? I've got a message for you, all right, but it's not in an envelope. I'm Nippy Cochran. Well, hello, Nippy Cochran. That confession you coax out of my sister isn't worth the tape it's recorded on. It's phony. The police seem to like it. And nuts. I kill the old porky now. Oh, that's your story, and it could be phony. Look, I'll tell you why the police like Mona's better. Huh? Leo died from a knife wound in the left part of his chest. There were no signs of a struggle. That means he was probably killed by somebody who just walked up to him and pushed. Someone he trusted, a friend. That doesn't fit you, but it fits your sister. I've got the answer to that. It says in the paper that confession of hers lifted the finger off me. The least I can do is take it off her. And you know how that's done. It's a little late for guesswork, Nippy. I'll be killing the same way with the same knife while she's alibied by the police. That'll clear. What's it going to do to you? And if you get close to me, you can believe me. There's going to be signs of struggle this time. I don't have to get close to you. The knife came from the usual place in his collar behind his head. His aim was perfect. I felt the shock just over my heart. But the telephone books I taped to my chest called his number. The knife bounced off and Nippy stood there with his mouth hanging open. Then I found something to throw. Something I could aim just generally. A chair. Ah! He stumbled back from the impact. And before he could collect his wits or his balance, I let him have a barrage. (laughs) 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 (sighs) I should have known. A bail bondsman doesn't know the right people. Expense account, item eight. Fifteen dollars, doctor fee. If it wasn't worth it to you, it was worth it to me to get that adhesive tape off by using alcohol instead of violence. Uh, expense account, item nine. Twenty-eight fifty. Replacement of hotel room furniture broken in final brawl. And expense account, item ten, if you don't mind. Three hundred and sixty-seven dollars and twenty-five cents. See enclosed bar, cafe, and theater receipts, buying my way back into the favor of the magnificent Mona. Oh, and you may ask me how I was clever enough to know that she was innocent all that time. I didn't. But I could hope, couldn't I? Um, expense account total, original retainer, not returnable, $500.71. Signed, yours, um, truly... Johnny Walker. I mean, dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Ed Max, Paul Dubov, Sidney Miller, Jim Nusser, and Georgia Ellis. The special music is written and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Be sure to be with us at this same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. It's fascinating, it's challenging, it's something unusual in radio fair. Yes, that's what folks are saying about CBS's popular Sunday program, Invitation to Learning. You'll renew old acquaintances in literature. You'll make some exciting new ones when you make a Sunday afternoon listening habit of CBS's Invitation to Learning. Remember the time every Sunday afternoon over most of these CBS stations. Stay tuned now for Vaughn Monroe and his caravan. They follow immediately over most of these CBS stations. Paul Masterson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. (laughs) 